Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's EA view on the archetype of Capricorn. Today, we're here with Deva Green. Hi, Deva. Jordan Smith. Hello. And Sarah DeHaven. Hi. So, and thank you so much to the incredible Sue Hilliard, who's always working hard behind the scenes to make this show possible. Um, so Capricorn, Capricorn's cardinal earth, and for all its go-getterness that we associate with Capricorn, like the image on the next slide of an individual climbing the highest peaks, it is a yin sign and the energy returns here and forces us to go inward to assimilate. So we've highlighted some of the EA keywords associated with Capricorn. And um, we can start by chatting a little bit about what we appreciate most about the Capricorn principle. Deva, would you like to start us off? Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, from the way I think about Capricorn in its highest and, and brightest expression is uh, responsibility and uh, self-determination um, that I've often found that the key to working with Capricorn energy uh, to bring it to its strongest point is to really reflect on areas where we can uh, become more mature, where we can perhaps become more responsible for ourselves. And if we ever find we're in a place of futility or feeling that we're stuck and we just can't do it, look at to where Capricorn is and motivate yourself up that mountain, as they say. <laughs> okay. Jordan, what about you? Yeah, so <clears throat> I have a lot of cap in my chart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you do. So uh, what I've experienced and what I've seen with other clients, it's definitely about learning how to have a natural authority, um, meaning that sometimes you have to step outside of the status quo, and that can be really scary, and that's kind of part of the determination part of, you know, um, it kind of enacts the whole uh, earth trine that you have to, you know, be rooted in your self values and to have a discernment. So that way, when you get to Capricorn, you can make the correct judgments. And that ultimately helps us gain even more personal wisdom. And that's when we really get to shine in our own natural authority. So that can be sometimes stepping away from uh, situations that are the status quo of our life. So yeah. Love it. Sarah, what about you? Yeah, um, so I grew up in a Capricorn household and I'm a Capricorn myself. So my mom, my brother <laughs> and me, all Capricorns. And uh, wow. pretty, yeah, yeah, it's definitely a karmic thing. But um, well, there you go, karma, Capricorn, cause and effect, <laughs> yeah. right? You learn by being right in reality it is all about reality without any frills and on one hand you know as we can see in the archetype keywords here you mentioned things like repression oppression depression um societally just based on the kind of the structure culturally humanity has brought itself to at this point we often see these things as negatives but they're actually required to grow um, one of the things about Capricorn that I'm sure you're all aware because of the polarity of it being cancer, uh, some of the real gold in Capricorn is to go into the feelings. Why do we feel oppressed? Why do we feel depressed? It gives us insight into what we need to do next to be, as Jordan was saying, in integrity, right, to who it is we are. And sometimes that is stepping out of the status quo. So I think what I like about Capricorn is it is the archetype of who it is that we want to be in this world and this life. And it helps us to get the clarity um, to see what realistically we need to do step-by-step step to make that happen. Love that. Yeah, I agree. I think um, for me, I really like that Capricorns have kind of figured out duration and since it rules time and um, figuring out how to kind of operate within the social building blocks to be able to get whatever it is they need to um, get accomplished and sort of step into their own maturity and authority. So yeah, it's a very cool archetype. Um, <clears throat> okay, great. Which will lead us into our um, transit of the month. 
Perfect. Jordan and Sarah, if you want to lead us into telling us about the Capricorn transit of the month, that would be great. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is a full moon that is happening in the sign of Cancer on January 6th. And when we have full moons, I always say this, um, it brings up emotional content for all of us to work on. And full moons are innately have an opposition to the sun. That is why we have a full moon is when the moon opposes the sun. And so it can also mean that something has become a little out of balance. And whenever we're looking at this full moon, there's a lot going on. So a lot of this is going to be looking for the answers within to conduct and invoke our natural authority in some way, shape, or form. And this can deal with your family system or it can also deal with work. So <clears throat> the moon is also trying the south node in the sign of Scorpio. And so really having to look at our bottom line, what is the emotional and psychological content that is coming up for all of us to work with? And where have we maybe felt like we are externalizing inner validation instead of gaining or finding that natural authority within ourselves? So <clears throat> there is a Sun Mercury trine Uranus, and the Sun and Mercury is in a new phase. And this is really speaking to, um, this trine is a disseminating, I believe, and it is really about <clears throat> being able to, you know, uh, look at what our own intrinsic values are. How are you meeting your own needs? Are you able to find security within meeting your own needs? The moon is also, I have all of these written down. Um, it is in a, a sextile with Uranus in the North Node. It's also sextiling Neptune. And then it's also, then Neptune is sextiling um, the Sun and Mercury retrograde. And this is really um, bringing a, me and David were kind of talking about this, a sense of friction, right? And it's so that you can, it puts like the, the gusto or the drive behind kind of these Capricorn words to be able to meet one's own needs, right? To gain that sense of inner security and validation that this moon is bringing up. And ultimately it's really about looking at the truth of your situation. And because this moon is also square to Chiron, which is ruled by, uh, you know, uh, Mars and Gemini, It'll still be retrograde. This is really about making a choice that maybe you've been afraid to make before, that you haven't made before. And this brings that natural authority, having to answer what is right or wrong for yourself, and then really actualizing that and going after that. And um, that is... Uh, trining mars is also trining venus and that rules this uranus that is sextile to this full moon and so with venus in the sign of aquarius we are having to really get comfortable with being uncomfortable really um to really liberate from our past situations and to make a, a brand new choice going after it doing something that we haven't done before and so whenever I think of Venus and Aquarius as well, with part of this whole conversation with the full moon, um, this is really not, it's getting unstuck from the places where we have reached a place of our own status quo, where we have maybe gotten a little too comfortable. And so now we're having to make a choice. And this is through discernment and correct judgment. So yeah, Sarah, would you like to add on to any of this? Yeah, for sure. Um, really awesome insights, by the way, Jordan. And like I, what I see, um, you know, it's just so interesting. I love astrology because we can see similar things, but seeing it from different angles, different points in the plant in the chart. Like for instance, when you mentioned uh, the Chiron square to the sun, um, and and the moon, um, we can see it's also in a in conjunct to the south node of the moon too, right? So 
that's definitely going to, I think, underscore what you were saying about needing to get out of the comfort zone and it being a bit of a challenge because of that adjustment energy of the inconjunct, right? And um, to further uh, go into that, I mean, we can see that Venus is in a balsamic phase to Saturn, which is ruling that stellium between Pluto and Mercury and the sun. So when we have a full moon and it's like this culmination of what's been brewing inside of us and it's a Capricorn cancer energy polarity going on there, you know, what's been repressed. I mean, it's going to depend on everyone's individual subjective reality and whatever developmental stage evolutionarily we are. But uh, what we're going to see is, um, you know, like you said, you're on some level, those feelings are going to want to come up that where we're at as a species, I mean, we can see with the semi sextiles between Pluto and Saturn, and then um, Neptune, it's very awkward energy, you know, wanting to, in a sense, from what I can tell, realize that we need to do something different. That Chiron in, in Aries with a retrograde Mars set on top of that being ruled by a retrograde Mercury at the time of all this. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily, like I said, it all depends on who is experiencing this energy, but clearly we are being called to go within. Um, as Bess was saying about Capricorn energy, it is yin, so it's returning back to the center. So cognitively with mercury and mars even kind of like competing against ourselves turning inward rather than like comparing ourselves to the outer world what's an integrity for us you know what's working for us and what isn't our emotions are going to tell us it's going to come to a head at this time and sometimes with the nature of a full moon we might even see it projected onto others that we're observing either you know out on social media or in our household or wherever it is that we're interacting with people either passively or directly um, we can learn a lot about ourselves what motivates us and what's important to us at this time and even get indicators as to how we can kind of um at least from what i can see uh where we need to purge um parts of our desires that need to be let go of to work with that pluto and that south node um and where we can Kind of just even be open to receiving clarity on how what's our next steps you know one step at a time cardinal energy right so that's yeah. kind of what i'm seeing anyway yeah and i think honestly with i mean absolutely i agree with everything that you're saying sarah i think especially with like mercury being retrograde that even like packs a punch into this is something that has to come from yourself. Like you have, you're the person who has to intuitively go within, right? Because when Mercury is retrograde, it's more of an emphasis on the intuition, on the right brain. And so really going within and, you know, asking yourself what it is that I need to do. And like, you know, asking the question, is this in alignment with my values? Am I able to meet my own needs? Because this is Capricorn energy. Like, are you able to meet your own needs? So I love your reflection on that. It's very beautiful. Oh, thanks. And you just actually, one other thing I wanted to bring up, just as you were talking about my, like what's reflecting my values and my needs, I just realized Venus and and uh, and uh, Uranus and Taurus, they're in mutual reception too. So what that speaks to is there's definitely a really keen conversation between our value system, individuation, and what is required, like the, the shocks and the bumps that we need to face so that we can kind of just realize that we can come to a homeostatic state, regardless of how much stress we're feeling or maybe confusion. Um, north node of, uh, I think that's the north node of Mercury on Venus too, on top of that. So I just see all these further underscoring what you're saying. I'm just pointing out the transit, the points in the transit that reflect that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Do you, do you other ladies have anything, <laughs> any comments to, to add? I think you both said it beautifully. <laughs> I think really succinctly. And thank you so much, Ava. I don't know about you, but this feels great. You really dotted all the I's and <laughs> as they say. So thank you so much. That was just excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. So moving on to the herb of the month. Um, we are looking at comfrey this month, which is also known as knit bone or bone set. Sympho is Greek for growth together and phyto means plant, which is how it gets its genus name. But it was named as such because it promotes healing of the skin and bones, which explains why it's ruled by Saturn. And it's 
use dates back to 400 BC, as old as that, um, possibly even older. And it's most commonly used for joint and muscle pain. There are people, I know of individuals who've used it like when they broke a bone, like a toe or something, they'll put comfrey on it and it'll heal faster. I personally have never had the opportunity to do so, but um, I, I think it's great in terms of recovering from surgery or inflammation or, um, you know, people will apply comfrey oil to their torn ligaments or, um, it's it's arguably you know one of the best natural wound healers out there as well. It's great for skin irritations like eczema, psoriasis, acne, diaper rash, spider bites, bee stings, um, and you can you know there's a lot of different ways to use it. You can prepare a cold infusion and um, you know sort of like put put the tea bags on your eyes if you have been looking at the computer for too long. It helps with eye strain. You can use it as like a sitz bath if you know, you're dealing with hemorrhoids or recovering postpartum, it's, um, they have, the, they have identified some compounds in comfrey that are not, um, not so easy on the liver. So they recommend it, uh, external use only, though there are people who, um, will drink comfrey tea and whatnot. Um, and it's not recommended for women who are pregnant, um, or breastfeeding, but, um, Jordan, I know you've made some comfrey salves. I'm curious what your experience has been or any of the other team members. Yeah. So there's a couple of things. Um, I'm just going to be very Platonian with this. Uh, you were talking about hemorrhoid treatment. And so whenever I had my son Zeppelin, I made me like this you know, like a care package for whenever I got home um, because it was my second child. So ignorance was not bliss. I knew what was coming as far as the healing process. And I made a distillation <clears throat> of comfrey and then I just put it on, um, you can buy like little, it's not disposable, they're reusable um, like cloth makeup pads. And what I did was I put the distillation on that and then, you know, I just put it on the areas that needed to have a little extra healing. So there. And then um, also one of the salves that I make that people really, really enjoy and love. It's kind of, I have a lot of people who hunt who will get this salve and they take it with them and it has Arnica in it as well um, with comfrey. Um, I do CBD in there. Sometimes I'll do Balm of Gilead, which best, you know, that's like my favorite herb to use, you know, really plant. It's the bud of a, of a tree, but yeah, it, it's, uh, I have a lot of feedback from people whenever, um, I make this salve and it's really healing. I have another woman who uses it for psoriasis. She has plaque psoriasis that are covered in her feet. And she said, it's like one of the only things that she can put on there that doesn't burn. And so like the healing properties of it are just, even for her because of plaque psoriasis, it's a little bit, you know, uh, that's a little more harsh. It's, it's a hard illness to deal with when you're having a flare up, but she says it's one of the only things that like uh, soothes it. And, you know, I add in like uh, oats <laughs> um, whenever I'm making an infusion of an oil with that, just to kind of pump up the the healing um, and soothing properties of that. I love, I love comfrey. I think it, it's, I mean, like you said, it has so many different uses. Uh, I love that you talked about putting the tea bags on the eyes. That's great. So yeah, I, I love it. Amazing. I have a question. Could you potentially make like a poultice for yourself? Oh, with comfrey? absolutely. Have, like a sprain or, wow. Yeah. That seems so, so well suited for those with a strong Capricorn uh 10th house yeah uh, archetype because let's say their joint joint pains in specific Completely. Um, I know some that would really benefit from having a, a healing herb like that yeah, yeah. especially like arthritis or fibromyalgia um, uh -huh. there's a lot of benefit there as well um and this is another cool thing uh <laughs> Um, it jogged my memory. So having kids here in Oklahoma, we get hornets like out the wazoo, hornets and bees. And um, if one of my littles gets like uh, stung, what I've Ooh. done is I've made a poultice with comfrey and tobacco. And yeah. whenever you wet it together and you put it on there, it does magic, you know? So, and it, I mean, it, it numbs it. It's 
uh, a really interesting um, kind of cool thing for the kids too, even though they're like hurting, you know, it completely numbs it. It's almost like spraying lidocaine on it. So yeah. All right, thank you so much, Jordan, and thanks, Deva. Um, all right, on to our fingerprint of the month. So we've picked Tiger Woods this month um, as the signature for Capricorn. So a little bit, I mean, he's very well known, but a little bit about him. All right, he was born Eldrick Taunt Woods, um, but he's better known as Tiger. His father, Earl, had a military career in the Special Forces, serving two tours in Vietnam where he met Tiger's mom, Tita who's Thai, Chinese, and has Dutch ancestry. He was an only child and a golf prodigy. So he appeared on national television at the age of two, putting with Bob Hope, and it just kind of went on from there. His father was an avid golfer and served as his mentor and basically you know, put a club in his hand at a very young age and just coached him. Um, they were very competitive. They put a lot of pressure on him at a young age. Um, he dropped out of Stanford to turn pro in 96 and then quickly proved himself when he became the youngest person to win the Masters the following year with a record score at the age of 21. And he was 12 strokes ahead of everyone else. So um, we'll take a look at that transit a little later in the show, which will be fun. But really, like the rest is history from there. He went on to become the GOAT. And the reason he's considered the greatest of all time is because he's the first and only to win four majors in a row. So he didn't do it in the same year, which would be a grand slam. They call it a tiger slam because he did it over two calendar years. But it was four in a row and no one's ever done that. He's held so many records, um, but definitely was ranked number one in the world for longer than anyone else. And he really did change the game of golf as we know it. It said that every golfer on the tour owes Tiger their thanks because he made golf exciting and popular and he brought sponsors and dollars that had a trickle down effect, whether that was from tournament wins or for sponsorships. Um, he made golf really popular and more modern. And um, there are also plenty of stories of you know, young people who were inspired to play after watching him win. Many of the pros on the tour now, you know, owe their interest in golf to watching Tiger win. And, um, you know, there were a ton of golf courses that were built basically after golf became more popular because of Tiger. So, um, you know, he's also very well known for his personal challenges that he's faced over the course of his life. In late 2009, his wife found out that Tiger was having an affair with a nightclub manager, which resulted in the dissolution of his marriage with his wife, Elin, um, with whom he had two children. And, um, you know, it, it sort of came out that he had affairs with many women and he went to rehab for um, sex addiction. And he's also, you know, he struggled and suffered numerous injuries over his career. In 2008, he had two stress fractures in his leg and a torn ligament, but he won the U.S. Open on a broken leg. Like, I don't know if there's anything more Capricornian than that. Um, in 2019, he had, he'd had four back surgeries. He thought he'd never be able to play again. It was ranked, you know, 1,199th in the world, and he won uh, you know, he hadn't won a major in over a decade and he went on to win the Masters and it was an incredible comeback and, um, you know, then struggled again and had a fifth back surgery in 2022 and then he was in a car crash. Um, and so which caused compounding, you know, compound fractures in his legs and he was unable to walk on his own after that. And again, he thought he'd never be able to play, but he made another comeback to the Masters in 2022. And so no one really knows what's next for Tiger because he just has this ability to surprise everyone. But for now, you can watch him playing in tournaments with his son, Charlie. And um, Deva, <laughs> do you want to kick us off with Tiger's natal chart analysis, starting with his evolutionary state and grounding us in the Pluto paradigm with the Pluto and the notes? Oh, thanks so much for that, that excellent background. And uh to get your input as well, do you feel that he's perhaps first stage individuated or just breaking in? I feel like, like more con third, third stage consensus consent. may yeah. be coming into first. Yeah, I think okay. you're right on. All right. So uh, let's say he's in the third stage consensus and maybe transitioning or getting his foot <laughs> in the individuated. Um, from my understanding, seeing Pluto in the, the first house uh, in Libra, and the south node being in Taurus and eights that uh, it's a, a, 
an emphasis on growing into uh, specifically relationships with uh, others professionally and with himself, seeing the Taurus energy that really embody or help him grow into what his intrinsic values are and to root or ground in a fundamental self-reliance. And uh, I, from what my feeling is and from what I've learned that the root of the core of that is in the context of relationships, um, being there because you want to be, not out of a need to be. And when that shifts on both ends, there can be that underlying commitment to one another, to where it's not these brief and intense initiations with whatever experience where a small portion of yourself, seeing the Pluto in the first, being able to discover uh, a part of who you are that wasn't unknown as, as the core, or is the root that's going to be driving the soul in terms of self-discovery, freedom and independence to initiate what, um, whatever with, with whomever, if that can be a potential experience to grow. And from one of his quotes that I feel really encapsulates his growth and uh, um, also his uh, maturity through hard knocks or through separation, uh, seeing uh, the North Node being in, in Scorpio in the second is uh, he talks about how um, winning is not everything. In essence, it's living with integrity and living with truth. Uh, and how that he became aware that he slipped away from his values. Um, and uh, from my understanding, that really propelled him to the polarity point in, in uh, Aries in the seventh house where there was more equal footing, uh, co-equality, where both people were growing uh, into who they were meant to become in co-equal ways and commitment was, was uh, an underlying value. Uh, from what I understand, he said he always understood that relationships were an essential part of his growth. <laughs> you can see that in the seventh house polarity point and making it last. And um, uh, one quote before I pass it back to you, and we can talk about the rulers all together as well. Um, I just love the scene. It's also that sun in Capricorn in the fourth. He says, um, yes, where's he here? The joy I get from winning a major championship doesn't even compare to the feeling I get when a kid writes a letter saying, thank you so much, you changed my life. And seeing those shifting of values from the, the south node in Taurus in the eighth to the north node then being in Scorpio in the second house and the polarity point growing into uh, more of his uh, authentic self and initiating those kind of experiences where no matter how much he won, it was more a feeling of um, being a, a model for others or knowing that you had a positive impact on somebody else. Thank you. Jordan, what do you think? Yeah, I am going to be looking at his Mercury and Capricorn and his fifth house. And I have to say, Tiger's chart, um, it, you know, an EA, you just can't, you can't make, you can't make it up. Like the, um, archetypes in his chart just really ring hugely true to the dynamics that I've learned about him. Um, so let me break this down a little bit to kind of reflect on what I'm meaning. With Mercury and Capricorn in the fifth house, for one, there is, there's a fifth house dynamic and it takes an extreme self-focus to be able to go after or to actualize what it is that you're supposed to, to get after in this lifetime, right? And we can tell with the trine from his Mercury to his South know that this is something that he has been working on. You can also tell that with the trine from his Mercury to his ascendant being in Virgo. Um, I think that it's really interesting how for him, uh, his Mercury also, it's, you know, in Capricorn, 
he was talking about golf and talking about how it was an elitist sport, Capricorn, you know, in the fifth house. This also represents he was really the first person of color to come in Capricorn and break the status quo of this, you know, whole sport. And so you can see also with Gemini ruling his 10th house and it being ruled uh, ruled by that Mercury, that this is part of his evolutionary story and maybe why he, you know, cho chose to come in with darker skin as a way to really, you know, be, break out of the status quo of what this elitist sport was, right? He has a, uh, an opposition to his Saturn. And so this is really about him not relying on his public persona as a way to feel um, it's cancer on the 11th house cusp as a way to feel secure. So he was really, we can see how that created or it reached a limit or an imbalance. And so some of the things that came up for him were to really serve the purpose to individuate and to be able to, you know, create a self-validation that only comes from within. It doesn't come from our job or, you know, from our talents that we have. There is also, man, there's so much to his chart. There, he said, uh, someone said that uh, after his dad passed, that golf became like Zen to him. And that is so his Mercury, you know, trining that ascendant and Virgo, that this really became a spiritual place for him, which really speaks to, you know, kind of trying to step into the more individuated stages, straddling that, you know, from going from really identifying with the status uh, or your public persona that you find in Capricorn to now, you know, uh, and we can get into it a little bit whenever we talk about his Saturn return, but really finding a peaceful place out there for him to connect with something much bigger than himself. And that also reflects the nature of the fifth and the 11th house as well. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Uh, his Mercury squares his Chiron and his Chiron is ruled by Mars and it's in the ninth house. And so we can also see with the retrogrades going on um, that yet again, there's something been going on in previous lifetimes that he is needing to, you know, reevaluate as a, as a way to resolve what that is. And so this can be maybe feeling not seen in a, in a prior life, not seen as an equal. And so that could really have been his driving force in this lifetime as, you know, representing someone who is a, uh, you know, who doesn't look the same as the people that are on the field as him and really having to find the inner security to validate himself and saying that this is enough. You know, I, I have my own authority. Watch me play. I'll show you, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, the proof is in the pudding. There's also, uh, well, can I add to that Jordan? Just yeah. to, thinking. So, you know, his Mercury in Capricorn, one of the things that's really interesting about that is the, like, people will tell you that no one plays a stronger mental game than Tiger. It's the like, extreme self-focus. It's, it is. And his father taught, um, as an instructor of military science and tactics at the city college of New York. And yeah. so he taught Tiger, like how to not be distracted. I mean, and he pushed him and he you know, sort of like tortured him to make him really yeah. mentally strong and focused. And he had that sort of, you know, the, the structure of consciousness, the, the boundary. And, you know, they would say like, he's aptly named because with that Mercury in his, it's in his fifth, right. It's, um, he would like stalk his prey on the course. Like they, they were like, it literally was like a tiger coming, mm -hmm. stalking you like you, that's how you felt. And he wigged so many people out playing these mental games, fifth house, right. Yeah. That he had so much fun. I mean, he just tortured his opponents mentally, like yes. by having such a he strong mental game. Phil Mickelson. Totally. He, he, um, his dad also, I thought that this was interesting because his Mercury being in Capricorn in the fifth, this is like the whole child prodigy thing going yeah. on. You know, his dad said, um, kind of going off of what you're talking about, 
is that whenever he was an infant, his dad strapped him into his, uh, where he was eating his high chair and was, you know, all Tiger would do was watch. So it was the intense mental focus that he had. And like, he wouldn't even stop to eat, you know, they had to like feed him as his dad was like doing all of this. Right. I wanted to say well, one more thing. You're, and so then you're talking about the square to Chiron in the seventh. It's like, well, what does that do to your personal relationships? You know, like that creates a lot of tension, a lot of stress when you have such a strong mental focus on one thing, but then there's, you know, the tension that builds. Yeah. Um, Sarah, do you want to pipe in with your thoughts? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, actually that kind of goes into the Saturn in Leo in the 11th because there's an opposition there. It's kind of an opposition. I'm pretty sure. Just let me double check. I'm pretty sure that's an opposition. <laughs> Yeah, um, I just love the relationship between him and his dad, though. I mean, yes, it was difficult, but he's a Capricorn through and through. I've been watching tons of interviews of him um, ever since I knew that we would be talking about him. And although, um, you know, although their relationship obviously was, we could say, militant to an extent, you know, um, there was an appreciation there. And he's got this Saturn retrograde. So the Saturn retrograde, interesting about that from an EA perspective, at least from what I understand, is it's uh it's an it's Saturn turned inward. So there's this building of self-discipline, building of individuation, like you're focusing towards that Uranus. And Earl, his dad, said in an interview uh back in the day that he he couldn't, or it might have been actually in his book to teach a tiger, how to teach a tiger, it was something like that, um, that he couldn't tell him what to do. Um, it was more about meeting him as a respectful equal, as a friend. And we can see that Saturn in Leo in the 11th, the 11th house does speak to friends. And as Jordan pointed out, the 11th house cusp is cancer and it all leads to his son in that fourth house. So, I mean, it, he really- I just got just, chills. Yeah, he's like his father's son. And I don't know, I feel like his mom has talked about, cause the, you know, Saturn can be the disciplinary parent and she certainly was too, from what I understand. So Saturn could be speaking to both of them in his chart um she even said like she wishes that you know that um in the next life she gets to be his mom again i i feel as though this is a long time partnership or co like almost like a family collaboration that's been happening here and that saturn and leo i guess when he was young he was actually quite shy he had a speech impediment and needed to um get therapy to um to, to correct that. And he mentions, um, you know, 11th house projection with Leo projection of who do you think you are? Why are you shining so bright can kind of be a thing because, you know, on first glance, from what I understand, uh, at least in a 60 minutes interview I was watching, um, the woman who was interviewing him said, you know, are you a snob? Like, do you think you're better than other people? And he vehemently denied that. And I got to say, I mean, that's that Mercury and Capricorn sincerity is a thing too when you're really in your integrity there's not a lot of time for that kind of a capricorn mercury to lie i don't think he would i honestly think he was shy you know um, and that people might have just not understood i mean i could i could go into a hole you know i can go into a rabbit hole with this chart because i mean it all when i think about fire signs and that saturn how the the moon saturn matrix kind of in, um interacts that moon and in uh in in Sagittarius in the third house you know speaking to of course uh Jupiter and Aries I mean his mom said they all you know there was a lot of barriers they had to face um just even getting onto the golf course when he was a kid because he was so different obviously because of his color as was mentioned in his culture and yet part of him as uh David was pointing out he might be moving into individuated we can see indicators in that chart where He's, he's mentioned in interviews too. I don't see myself as Asian or black or whatever it is. I'm a human being. That's how I see myself. So that Saturn is really speaking to going within, becoming my own person. And sure, he's had challenges. I can't say, you know, who hasn't. And, and of course, his chart speaks to all of that, as you've all pointed out so far. Um, but from what I can tell, you know, he's really listening to that call to master himself, to really be in his integrity, even with the mistakes he's made with his marriage and, you know, the pressure that we can see that he puts on himself as well to, um, which I feel is, uh, you know, when I see that Saturn retrograde is in Leo is ruling his uh, son and Capricorn, you know, 
he's doing it for his family. I mean, they invested, they, I think they took out mortgages on their homes to fund his career. So, you know, there's this obligation, but yet also this deep appreciation that he has. So when I think of Leo, that's really, you know, of course it's self-actualization, but it's also the opening of the heart. And when you think of Capricorn energy opening its heart, it's a, it's a bit of a process, <laughs> you know, it's a lifetime lesson, I guess. I, and I think he's doing his best. What can I say? Yeah, I think it's, it's, I agree with you. It's almost like you can see two different things in the chart, right? Like you see the, the Capricorn that's so regulated and regimented and, you know, well sort of put together and held. And then, you know, you look at the Neptune moon conjunction opposing that Mars. And it's like, you know, Jeffrey would talk about the core feeling of inadequacy, like on an emotional level there that, you know, can lead to lies and deceit. It's like an emotional trauma almost. And so, you know, and then and then they have to kind of confront them when they get outed. And so that Mars, Neptune, you know, moon situation, it, it can get in trouble if it doesn't get clarity and deal construction constructively with the inherent insecurity as well. And so, you know, in its shadow, it's going to lend itself to addiction, Neptune, and to sexual, sexual exploration, Mars. And, you know, especially in Gemini. And so, you know, as it evolves, it's like, it's a deeper knowing of the inner self and 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 its personal truth and then finding right action from there and um you know learning how to develop a deep emotional connection in order to actualize that pluto polarity point mm -hmm. can i say one more thing because i thought that this was so cool yeah so i used to play golf growing up and it golf is a sport of geometry through and through. And so when you look at his Mercury in the fifth house and also Aquarius kind of coloring that, and then Gemini on his 10th, this is a sport of geometry. And this <laughs> is also using the hands and the eyes, you know, and then body ergonomics. So I thought like, you, you just can't make this up, you know, like yeah. the signatures for that are all right there. Well, it's also, I mean, that moon in a fire sign to um, opposing Mars, that, that'll that do it also. I think, you know, they call him the Michael Jordan of golf and Michael Jordan had moon trine Mars and he's got moon opposite Mars, but it that, that Sag moon lends himself to optimism. It's like, I'm going to get on the course and I'm going to win. I don't care. And the moon Mars opposition is like, I don't care if the doctors tell me that I have to rest. I'm not going to, I'm going to win. Like, I'm going to go out there and do this. And um, I think it makes him fiercely competitive and very naturally talented and he being in the third house, ninth house, it's like he's constantly seeking balance between that intuitive and sort of mental abilities. And he's he would probably be a phenomenal teacher, honestly, looking at his chart. Well, it makes me think about how he is with his kids and yeah. teaching his son how to golf right now. Absolutely. A quote I found by him that, in my view, really shows the, uh, um, in one way where he's really accessing um the emotional quality that you guys are talking about too in terms of uh the way i i from what i've learned it's the teaching that the ultimate strength is in the vulnerability and by allowing himself to feel that vulnerability in terms of when he came out of alignment with what he valued and what he felt was intrinsically right or wrong despite what others may have been saying and he really got in touch with his nurturing side, seeing mm -hmm. that son in the fourth house. And uh, a couple quotes that come to mind are, I have to earn the love and respect of my children. <laughs> and he also says that when he was younger, he was not the most talented. He was not the strongest. He was not the biggest. He was not the smartest. But what he had was his work ethic. And without his work ethic, and um, his uh, uh, seeing that North Node in the second, uh, just uh, absolute self-effort relative to self-mastery. And, oh, it's like a fallback point, always falling back on just how hard can I work, which I found is really Capricorn through and through. And it's like that balance of the nurturing side and uh, balancing that with the discipline aspect. And as you guys were sharing how that came out in his uh, personal relationships and also his persona that people 
uh, um, are inspired by him, not per se by how much he wins, which is just incredible, but by the underlying uh, self-determination in my view that, gosh, he won on a broken leg. <laughs> so it's impacting them on, on that cancer level as well, seeing the polarity and being able to nurture that within himself too. Yeah, I love um, I love what you just said, Dave. And I also, I, I love what you mentioned in your book, which is amazing, by the way, on the, on the note, on the, the moon and the nodes, um, about the, with a Sag moon, it's a journey to self-discovery and personal honesty, and they can overreact to their environment. And I think that's what happened. It was like a pressure cooker and with too much Capricorn pressions, you know, the suppression, repression, depression, and the pressure, and then the steam has to go somewhere to escape. And that's what, you know, that's what happened with the, you know, sexual relationships. And I think, you know, it, it sort of triggered a traditional, like the keywords we had listed earlier, the fall from grace and, um, you know, leads you back to that cancer polarity and it forces you to go inward. And, you know, he got help and now he has structured his relationships completely differently, again, activating that Pluto polarity point. So, well, yeah. can I jump in on that? You actually just yeah. came to something off I want to share yeah. that I see in relation to that. So he's got a trine between, uh, it looks like a, a first quarter trine between his Saturn and his Venus, you know, and that links to Pluto. So there's this, you know, he did mention once um, that he didn't know why he had the confidence issues, like why he had them. He just knew that he felt it. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, when I think about a trine between Saturn and Venus, and then he came in as he did with a very multicultural ancestry, you know, like through his, both of his parents, um, a lot of that was projected onto him in a, in a sense, from what I could tell, um, not just from the parents, but also like actual experience with the difficulties, you know, um, breaking into the golf world. So, I mean, that trine with, with uh, Saturn and Venus, I just see it's like, it's, it is a Leo trine, so to speak, that's Leo energy. So it's almost like satisfaction for him to see how he can find uh you know just through that pluto balance in how he instinctively interfaces with the world and how he plays his game like i think the more he can find himself in the zone the more maybe even himself he feels since that leo energy connects to creative self-actualization of our soul's purpose with that solar energy yeah just wanted to share that amazing okay should we take a look at the transits anything else to add Okay, cool. So this was his first master's win. And, um, you know, for me, what sort of jumped out was the Saturn sitting on its Jupiter. So, um, you know, it's changing his status. It's galvanizing his talent into a sustainable career. It's activating that Pluto polarity point, which is going to you know, take that first house Pluto that values independence and personal freedom, and it's going to pull him into more sophisticated relationships with others in order to mature and evolve. Um, I'm not sure what other, what you all feel about the transits here, but would love to hear your thoughts. I mean, I'm looking at even like his Neptune on his Mercury and then his South node on his Vesta, which those are both ruled by Neptune. You know, this is someone who has clearly reached a point of some type of culmination is wanting to start a new cycle now, you know, of more, I think this goes back to, we see the South node on his Vesta you know, not being able to reach that place prior to this. And in this lifetime now being able to, especially 29 degrees Neptune sitting on his Mercury, you know, now being able to get out there and view himself even as an equal, right? And so that's more of a natural value that's coming out. It was kind of like this, the, the time or the awareness that like po posting a stamp on something like a self-validating stamp, you know, like I did this now I can move on. I can keep going, you know, instead of kind of always wondering. Yeah. And his, um, the sun, the transiting sun's on his Chiron as well. So this is uh since his Chiron is retrograde and in, in his life, he's going to be, you know, peeling back the layers of the onion as Jeff Wolf Green would say, 
uh, with regard to the Chiron archetype. So to have the sun transiting over that and Aries no less connecting to his Mars retrograde, it's um on one hand it's it's a, it you know it's it's a almost like a validation that he is living his purpose. He's he probably had a sense of healing something even if it wasn't fully conscious. Um, with regard to his masculinity, with regard to his ability to um, do what Mars wants to do for his Pluto, to, you know, meet the desires of that soul. And then I see the transiting Mars and the transiting North Node are kind of closing in on each other, on, in on each other too, which makes me think about his Virgo um, ascendant and his Capricorn energy. So there's this closing of a cycle where it's like, I'm still thinking of the next cycle to come though. What's next? This isn't the end. I, you know, what, how can I get better? How can I do it even better the next time? And so, you know, that's just something interesting I saw there that I wanted to share. Love that. I love that Jupiter is transiting as transiting Jupiter is um, trining his Mars, like to the degree. Um, makes you want to get all the athletes astrology charts so you can bet. I mean, I would put money on him seeing that alone. Maybe we should go into business doing it. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> <laughs> looking to it this pluto it looks like it's sextiling let's see here well semi-sextiling this uranus energy and scorpio on the second so perhaps a bit of a liberation or a breakthrough and mm -hmm. um setting a bit of key thoughts for the future almost like a a new psychological groove seeing the scorpio energy that would lend itself to saying look you know i can i can do this this is perhaps a, a an echo in him going first of many and and showing showing himself through his his own efforts what he's capable of yeah i love that and especially that's that gets reiterated with transiting pluto trining his saturn and then mm. transiting saturn sitting on the jupiter it's like what you've put your dedication and you know hard work day after day hour after hour is like going to build here Well, um, why don't we take a look at the next one? So his father, um, this is his, a transit of his father's death. Um, we don't have the exact time, but we were able to estimate. And I mean, most notably, this occurred during Tiger Saturn return, which, um, you know, as we know, is an act of the play ending. And you have to learn how to move on as an adult in the world in a new way. And because his father, which is represented by Saturn, was the most influential force in his life, you know, his his best friend, his mentor, his teacher, his, you know, he helped develop him as a person and his career. It was a huge shift for Tiger. And the way he moved forward, this is when things started to shift for him. He started, um, you know, he went into a little bit of a spiral. He started training with the military, started, that's when his injuries started happening. Um, and it's, uh, it's sort of, you know, you can see it kind of clear as day here. Ooh, can I talk about this? Yeah. So, Please. um, as someone who has a lot of cap, and I'm sure Sarah, you will probably have some great reflections on this too. <laughs> Saturn returns, man. Um, so like you were saying, this is, you know, it's his dad's path passing and stirring the Saturn return. If you also look, Pluto is transiting his fourth house. The moon has literally the cusp of his 11th is at 24 cancer. This moon is at 25 and the south node is transiting in his first house. This is, to me, screams that, especially with the Mercury opposing Saturn, that you're going to have to find this inner security to play the game, to do the thing, you know, to believe in oneself, to be authentic on your own, to view yourself as an equal without this authority. Like it's essentially to be your own authority is what I get from this. And, you know, dad dying during the Saturn return with all of these signatures that I'm talking about really to me screams, this is like the, the start of the next play of learning that inner security all by himself, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, Pluto moving into the fourth house is no joke. You know, that is a removal of what you felt emotionally secure 
that was no long that kind of needs to leave and um i mean from what i understand earl's death was terrible he went through a lot of you know difficult illnesses multiple illnesses so i don't want to you know be um like just flippant about that but for for tiger's development it seems obvious what you're saying that it was time for him like uh, that that next initiation into his evolutionary development thinking of that saturn return um actualizing who you came here to be in capricorn you know, it is to become self-mastered, yes, but it can be through some very, very real situations. And with it being in the fourth house, you know, there's almost like um this earthquake, we could say, trying to crack in past that Capricornian shell and into the feelings so that he can start accessing the deeper parts of himself so that he can understand, like, not just, oh, I'm a responsible person and I'm this and that on the surface, but like, why? Why am I? called to be this why am i called to have these experiences like as we know later you know he um he it was it was brought to light that he had kind of like a sex addiction but um obviously that was there's something to it so this i think as you said it, it was an initiation into that next realm of discovery in the underworld of tiger woods's psyche yeah i love that you even said an earthquake um with it going, Pluto going through the fourth, like as you're saying that I'm looking at the transmitting moon going through the 11th house and what more of a way to say earthquake than that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Um, the third and final transit that we pulled um, to take a look at was this 2022 master's comeback. We borrowed this picture from the 2019 master's comeback, but um, the 2022 one, he did not win. But um, what we thought was most well one of the things that's quite interesting about this is that he's he's having a nodal flip here and um you know it feels like he's meaning the past in a new way like he may not have the same physicality he used to but there's a note there was a notable change in his demeanor and how he played the game so he had lightened up a bit you know he was seen engaging with the fans he was seen laughing he seemed to be having more fun with the game now and i think that's just a testament to you know his evolution and we get we got to see that on his journey mm -hmm. yeah especially like his the pluto sitting on his mercury which is then trining his uh, ascendant and then all, all of that stuff, you know, transiting through his sixth house, it's like he's reached a level where it's a transitionary stage of his development of, you know, feeling like this is more moving into the first stages of individuation, it feels like, right? Um, now, like, there's a bigger purpose with the work that I'm doing, like, and it goes back to kind of like being responsible and having integrity with what he's doing in the way in which not just the feeling that I get when I look at this, it's not about how the public perceives me as the best, but it's like I'm being a role model for people here that are younger than me, that look like me or feel like, you know, so it's this even bigger, higher calling, I feel like that is really, you know, uh, getting to express through more natural values instead of the temporal ones that he was having, you know, prior to this. Yeah, makes sense. And, and Pluto being on his Mercury, it's, it's new phase, like it's just at the new phase. So there's a new cycle initiating here with regard to how he's processing information, how he's communicating. It's fifth house Capricorn. So if you think about time and fifth house energy, having that Leo bent to it, it's softening up the earth a little bit. Maybe spring is coming. I don't know. <laughs> but I know because I'm having a Pluto Mercury transit, but mine is balsamic. So I don't know what it's like on the other end, but boy, does it get tense. So I'm sure he's probably feeling a release of tension on top of that around this time, even though he didn't necessarily win. I mean, I've seen interviews with him and his son after, um, as they've been, you know, playing games together and, you know, it, it do, he does feel, I mean, he's still got a Capricorn Mercury, so it's very like controlled communication, but you can tell he's lightening up. And I mean, he does have third house energy with his Venus in his chart and his Neptune and his moon. And then he's got that 
Mars and Gemini. So I'm sure they want to let loose a little bit. They don't want to be bogged down by that Capricorn. So yeah, um, I do think you're right. What you what you're both were saying, just how he's he's getting into that individuation, that individ individuated self a little bit more and having more fun, which, you know, it's interesting to see the nodal flip as, as best mentioned, just how he didn't win. He's been so focused on winning and I'm sure he still is, but he's having, he's letting himself have more fun with the process too, it seems. Yeah. I, I think with Chiron opposing his Pluto too, it's like, there's an opportunity to heal here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting. I think I mentioned this to you best, but so this 2022 masters, I don't know if you guys saw this, but you know, Mercury on is Chiron six house stuff, Pluto trying his Virgo, this nodal flip dealing with values. Uh, his son and him were doing an interview and his son was like, the, uh, the guy interviewing them was like, so what were you thinking about your dad? And his son was like, well, I was a little worried about him. And like Tiger looks at him and is like, yeah, because I really suck. Like, so it's just like he was doing like essential humility in a really playful way. And it's almost like his son came and brought him back down to earth too. Like, hey, you know, so and it just showed the expression of that his mental state has really changed, like, you know, throughout this whole journey but I love that. So I, I, I wanted to say it. <laughs> you do. I think that's the beauty of having the, you know, the Capricornian fall from grace, right? It's like, there's no way to go, but up and you get to do it like authentically. And, um, you know, there's incentive to kind of lighten up. That's the way through, I think for Capricorn. Absolutely. Absolutely. And going back to what you, you were saying best around meeting the past in a different way, relative to future and seeing that um, the transiting north node was on his south node in Taurus in the eighth set, perhaps it was a, a well, and seeing that Mercury Capricorn in the fifth, feeling more empowered based upon standing more authentically in himself first or being able to uh, value just being with the crowd and really enjoying what he was doing and uh, feeling good about what he was projecting out there, so to speak, or where he was in himself, seeing that Taurus energy in the eighth house. And so just because he lost, he may have been better able to to shake it off or say, you know, be, be questioning, bringing into having that question that does it always mean that I have to be the best at something or questioning that always having to win for it to mean something. And from my view, as you guys were saying, that can be a real third stage consensus, perhaps breaking into that individuated, that questioning of it um, in terms of what consensus in general would promote as being meaningful and having that being something defined more on his own terms, going back to Saturn retrograde and seeing the, uh, the North node being in the, the second and then transiting South node right there. So it's all coming from within versus it having it be something external. Mm. Perfectly said. I think that sums it up unless there's anything else we missed. Okay, great. Well, and we'd encourage whoever's listening too to, you know, put your feedback in the comments or if you're seeing, you know, what your analysis or thoughts are too. We we love hearing from you as well. Um, and then I think we can move on to the movie of the month, Deva. Yeah, uh, I thought that the movie Unforgivable with Sandra Bullock was a good pick for Capricorn because of how she interfaces with societal judgment after coming out of prison for 20 years and um, what she has to do to rebuild. And after coming out of that, she's totally fine as long as she can get housing, get a job. <laughs> she, all she wants is to just be able to reintegrate back into society in a, in a functioning way. And she also wants to, to recontact, uh, I think it was um, a, a younger sister who they forcibly severed contact with because of her imprisonment. And so she comes back and it's like, she is able to better determine what is her responsibility and what not. And she, natural judgment that she has a, an interfacement where they're, you know, 
telling her exactly why she can't see her, her younger sister. And it's really based on the judgment of her past and who then it's projected that she is based on that past. And she's able to stand within her own truth, her own authority. And it's like in my, my encapsulation of it, or I'm paraphrasing, she had a moment of, well, he who is, he who is without sin may throw the first stone. And when she says that, there's <laughs> just a whole breakthrough moment. And she is able to rebuild herself by getting uh, establishing a, a job and um, not really taking in the judgments about the past that were definitely a challenge. So I feel it's a, a good one for Capricorn in terms of natural judgment versus conditioned judgment. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, that I haven't seen it. Sarah, Jordan, have you all seen it? I have not. No, it's the first time I've heard of it, but it sounds really interesting. I'm going to have to check it out for sure. Yeah. David, and you always do such a great job connecting. Honestly. You, you have these little hidden gym gifts that I love, like when they come out. <laughs> I want to um, know David's like top 10, like 100 movie list, you know? Just uh, like, <laughs> on that list. like, what are the movies that changed your That'd life? Be your next David, book? Great. <laughs> I love it. Okay, I want we that started list my Gemini would never stop. <laughs> oh, and then? Yes. <laughs> oh, and then yes. there's this one? <laughs> We're here for it, Dave. Totally. <laughs> Amazing. And I think that is a wrap. Um, the final slides are the books available from Amazon on natural astrology. Um, the International International Voices of Evolutionary Astrology. It's a great collation. Highly recommend. Um, and then, as always, the School of Evolutionary Astrology by Jeffrey Wolf Green. Um, check it out. The website's right there. Tried and true, and um, it's a great place to start if you haven't visited already. Awesome. Um, inspirational message for Capricorn. One can have no smaller or greater mastery than mastery of oneself. Leonardo da Vinci. Aww. And I think that about sums it up. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.